Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. My name's Karina. I'm the sales manager at Between the Lines. And uh, I'm just going to be doing a quick preamble here. If you aren't acquainted with our press, we're um, a social movement nonfiction press founded in 1977, and we're situated in Toronto, Canada, traditional Wendat, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee territory, subject to the Dish with One Spoon Treaty. Uh, this land was stewarded by the Mississaugas of the Credit River and is home to many Indigenous peoples. I'd like to thank our co-host for the event, Verso Books, and I'd like to thank you all for um, gathering here for this Zoom event, supporting independent publishing. Uh, we're sold out, which is really gratifying in a year like this. Um, it's been really lovely to do these virtual events through the last few seasons and see how much support there is for getting um, books like this out into the world, um, which brings me to the reason we're here. The panel is Socialist Beasts, The Animal Block, and it's part of Radical December, which is a virtual book fair put on by Literal. Um, there are lots of other really great virtual events to check out that are running now, so I really encourage everyone here to tune in to uh, more Radical December events, and I'll drop a link to the event lineup in the chat uh, so you can check it out. And I also encourage uh, everyone who's listening right now to post questions if you have them for the panelists, uh, just using the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Um, so right now I'm, I'm just gonna quickly introduce the panelists we have today. We're joined by Fahim Amir. Fahim is a Viennese philosopher and author whose book Being in Swine just came out in English translation at the start of December. Uh, Troy Viteze is an environmental historian and currently a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University. And his book, Half, Half Earth Socialism, co-authored with Drew Pendergrass, will be published by Verso in spring 2022. And Stephen F. Eisenman is a professor at Northwestern and the author of 10 books, as well as a co-founder and director of art and strategy at Anthropocene Alliance. And they are joined by Jules Gleason, our moderator, who is a historian and comedian based in Vienna. So uh, clearly we're all in very capable hands uh, and I'm very happy to hand it off to Jules and get this uh, discussion started. Hello, hello. So we're here to discuss uh, the topic of socialist beasts today. And um, I thought I would begin with some discussion of being in swine, which has just been released. So perhaps some people are not familiar with it, but um, our opening question concerns this question of animals and agency. Um, uh, so in, um, uh, in Being and Swine, uh, we see this case um, concerning agency that animals are not just victims, but perpetrators as well, not only objects of human maltreatment under the sign of capitalism, but also biosocial entities whose history and struggles are bound up uh, with those of humans in many ways. So that's a passage from the introduction. So I would just like to open the conversation by, um, by sort of getting our speakers to respond to this quote. And um, if anyone in the audience has any further questions or any responses, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, maybe, uh, maybe for him can start us off as he's responsible for writing that. I didn't get it acoustically, so I should start because uh, I'm responsible for the quote. Yes, uh, of, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I think this quote is 100% uh, correct and important. Um, just, uh, just joking. Um, so to speak, uh, like generally speaking, I think it's important to broaden the perspective, uh, the political perspective um, of animals and animality and also nature in a certain way, because we got used to a certain notion of a sad animal modernity, especially in the in the critical um, tradition or also in the left where very often uh, animals appear to be like the, the little siblings of the working class, so to speak. Um, they are totally objectified and um, uh, um, victimized and, uh, um, and they don't even have the consolence of the, of the cultural industry, how sad it um, may be. And with um, this, um, this argument, I wanted at the first point, broaden the horizon of intelligibility uh, what 
what it could mean when, when, when we say animals are politically active. Like my first argument would be to resist your own oppression is, is in itself already a political act. But it also means that we have to rethink to a certain uh, extent what um, the political could mean. And just very shortly, just as an example, uh, the word political comes from, as it said, from, from old Greek, from polis. And it back in the days, it meant two things at the same time. But on the one side, it meant a certain spatial unity, uh, the administrative center of the Greek city-state. And at the same time, it also meant, uh, like polis meant the the collective, the group of those who are part of this polis, who are politically speaking out and uh, negotiating the things that are important. And from the first moment this word was, uh, so to speak, uh, used in this sense, it was clear that only certain entities were allowed in. Only free Greek men were supposed to be part of this polis. Everybody else, like plants and animals and women and slaves uh, had to stay outside where they e either had to work or they got eaten up. And my um, argument is like the walls of this police since then have fallen in many, many different ways. In my book, I take, for example, uh, the, um, the pigeons who occupy the cityscapes or I argue that it was the resistance of pigs to the mechanization um, of their killing in the late 19th century in the slaughterhouses of Chicago, their resistance provoked the uh, elements of modernization of capitalism. So I would also argue there's a zoopolitical political prehistory uh, of capitalism uh, until now, and we just start to unravel it, so to speak, just generally speaking. I can um, raise a question. Um, I'm just wondering about um, how self-evident it is or not that animals are agents. Um, your statement, Fahim, that uh, animals who resist their killing or their enslavement are acting politically, um, I wonder whether that isn't uh, too broad. Um, all creatures, uh, from ants to elephants, if you prod them, they will react. Same thing would happen at a, at a, even at a molecular level. Um, so I just wonder whether that's fair to say and whether it doesn't fall back on a unfortunate dichotomy between creatures who are agents and uh, creatures who are patients. The agent has the capacity to act. The patient has the capacity only to, re only to respond. I wonder whether that dichotomy has to be questioned in the case of animals and whether animals aren't, don't have capacities that are both like agents and patients and whether humans don't have capacities or don't act as both agents and patients. That is to say the concept may be a better concept, maybe one that I've used and others have used too, that is to, say, to speak of animals as possessing assisted agency or mediated agency. There's an agency that can only be operative in collaboration with humans or others who have the capacity to act more directly in the realm of the political. We can act in the political, we can act in the public domain, we can protest, we can vote, etc. Animals don't have those capacities, but they may have capacities in collaboration with humans to become more political. So I just wonder whether we need to be careful to avoid the either or agent patient and to argue therefore that an animal who is simply responding to pain is in any way acting politically. Yeah, for me, that's not, I, I would totally agree personally, from my viewpoint, I would totally agree with what you said. I not yet necessarily, maybe I wasn't that clear enough in my book, um, but it was also a start to open up a certain viewpoint. Uh, I don't, I, I think there is a continuity there, uh, also physically, also we all know that from being on a rally or on a, um, on a demonstration or something, there are moments of also of solidarity that are maybe more physical than totally consciously. You see somebody being attacked and you have feelings also of solidarity and you rush there even before really thinking these things through. And I would 100% agree with you, if I understood you correctly, that we have to rethink um, certain notions um, 
of personally, I don't use this word that much. Uh, I think maybe only in the introduction, like agency and agents. Uh, right. it's, uh, it was also a little bit tricky in, in terms of tra uh, translation. So I would say there's a continuity between a certain kind of resistant quality of um, what, um, a piece of wood or our bones against um, being manipulated or, or whatever. And there's a continuity to a full grown politically conscious revolutionary organization uh, as a university of working class or, or and so on and so forth. And I would say in between these um, posts, there are a lot of things and entities who um, behave or act or simply are um, in, in this continuity, so to speak. Also, I think, uh, for example, my sister-in-law. Troy, um, do you perhaps have a? Do you perhaps have a? Um, Troy, do you perhaps have a, a point to make on the question of animals as perpetrators or, or animals as, as victims? Um, I'm not sure if I have an argument or a question really on that point specifically, or at least not right now. Um, if I could just digress a little bit, I do want to stress to the audience, especially that I, you know, this is a great book. I really enjoyed this book. Uh, I was surprised by the book, which I think is like the best thing um, you can have, you can experience as a reader. And there's all these amazing anecdotes and facts and, and like a really broad interdisciplinary reading that's uh, explained uh, in a very, uh, I think, light and stimulating fashion. So I, I really admired that. So well done, Fahim. I, if anything, I want you to speak more and perhaps stress these unique qualities. I think, because I think you know the idea of the polis is something maybe someone might recognize, but other bits of the book, I had, I had no idea. For example, like a vegetarian Jacobin who was killed during the French Revolution, or this uh, this idea that, uh, or this problem that Buddhist monks who used to meditate over a decaying body, a decaying human body, can't do this anymore because there's so many preservatives. In our in our own bodies now that we do not decay as as we used to. So there's always like really um, powerful, strange, wonderful um, uh, facts put together in this book. Um, and there's a whole section on cocaine, another on termites. I mean, this is a very weird book, and I say that in the nicest and like most uh, as a compliment, really. So I want to stress that, and I want to hear more. I think uh, from Fahim uh, exactly how. Uh, he, why he included these, um, these, these examples and these anecdotes and how he, they cohere in his, in his head. And I suppose uh, that relates to what is the point of the book? I think that, uh, I think that should be clear to, to our audience. Like, what do you want to do with this book? Like, how is this intervening? And then I have some other questions, but I, I, I kind of want to leave it there. Because I think the question of agency is very important, but I, I like to kind of get at the big picture, like the really broadest um, uh, uh, angle of the book, perhaps. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's what, just that's what I just to, to follow up on that uh, question very briefly. This this um yeah this this question of um the, on this question of complicity and the the I, I also found the book very surprising in many places and probably the most surprising was the treatment of the humble honeybee, which is usually taken as a quite a pitiable animal who we have to save. But for him, you um, did a, an interesting historical investigation of the role of the honeybee in um, colonial settlements in North America. So maybe um, I'd be very interested to hear more about maybe that as an example of, of complicity of, of animals in, in broader processes in ways we maybe wouldn't expect. Uh, yeah, um, thanks a lot. Um, Actually, uh, so to speak, this um, this whole book uh, started uh, with an um, just with a side note. I was uh, among friends, and they asked me, well, "What are you doing, actually, Fahim?" And I said, "I'm an um, animal theorist from Afghanistan, uh, teaching at the Art Academy in Vienna." And usually, if you say that, you have uh, carte blanche because nobody knows what uh, Afghanistan animal theory art academy and uh, so on. But uh, they um, um, they ask more, and they just what you're doing actually. And then I just said, you know what? I'm reflecting um, that when when it comes to animals, uh, the left turns right. 
So, and one week later, um, one of these persons, uh, she, she has, she's part of a collective in Germany uh, who produce books. She asked me, don't you wanna think about that? What, what do you mean with that? When, uh, when it comes to animals, the, the left turns right. And so uh, coming back to uh, the question um, also of, uh, of Troy, um, Honestly, um, I wrote this book, uh, this book in two months. So there was something to be said. So it was not like years of rethinking and rearranging, but I wrote the first four chapters in three weeks in, in January. And then half year late in August, I wrote the, uh, another three chapters and then re we reworked it and it was there. So it was, um, and to be honest, I did, didn't have a clear audience because who should read this book? It's a little bit too philosophical and a little bit not enough philosophical. And it's about uh, animals, but also, uh, as I said, about the honeybees and uh, the idea of solidarity towards mosquitoes. Um, and I also argue that all the vegetarians in the world didn't save one single animal because capitalism doesn't work like that, but it make, make a lot of sense still to be vegan and vegetarian, but because maybe because of other reasons. So in a certain sense, uh, like the question of the animal is with me for at least 20 years or 25 years. And I'm part of academia and also of activism and also of, uh, of, uh, of this art world. And when I was asked, what do you mean with that? When, when it comes to animals, the, the left turns right. I had, um, I, I had the feeling these are the things I, have to, I, I can give now. So I have a lot of problems with the way things are dealt with usually, like animals only as poor, for example. Of course, they are exploited and it, it is terrible. Yeah, but it's this it's the same with like where my parents come from, Afghanistan. Of course, people are oppressed and it's terrible, but it's this is not the whole picture of it. And so I wanted, uh, so to speak, um, turn the light into the into direction where usually it's not uh, it's not looked at. Actually, my personal investigation um, is with pigeons. So for me, pigeons are something like, for Donna Haraway, it was the cyborg. Pigeons, for example, are a way for me to rethink questions of nature and culture and activism and so on. And just to, um, just to say a little, just one note, because Troy asked, asked for it. For example, my argument is um, pigeons shouldn't, like there's a lot of negative sentiments towards pigeons and i would i would say it's because um they take over urban space they seem to have no space of their own in the city they kind of disturbed um they make dirt in whatsoever and they're in a certain way they're the leftovers they have lost their jobs like communication or fertilization or so ever but they're still hanging around in the cities and looking at us and for me, it's two things are interesting here. On the one hand, I think because like pure, like, like dirt is matter out of place. That's not a new idea. That's an old one. And I think that's exactly that because pigeons take over certain spaces in the broad daylight. They, so to speak, copulate, um, they, they eat, uh, they all their things in the most representative spaces of, of the city not like the rats, uh, like in, in the night or in the nature culture borderlands where other animals show up, but they take over this, uh, this urban space. And because they are matter out of place, they seem to be dirty. So not, not the other way around, because they are dirty, we have to get rid of them. But because they seem to be out of place, the, uh, people are so ready to accept uh, that they are infectious and so on. And the other thing that I like about pigeons is they are there are relationships to other um, beings in the city. For example, uh, elderly people, like elderly women, especially. And one of my thesis would be, it's not like two losers meet in the park, like the elderly granny who has no grandchildren and because of that has to um, give all her energy into like these uh, animals who have no feelings themselves and no, no full subjectivity. But instead, I would argue that not two losers meet in the park, but that feeding pigeons in public space is a form of mass militancy of elderly people because they are uh, when they feed pigeons they're all kind of you know eco uh, police people who say don't do that you, you're you're feeding rats or um, or you're, you're making polluting the city or so on. and like animals 
but very often they're considered to be undialectical, unpolitical, conservative. Also elderly people are sometimes seen as conservative and undialectical and unpolitical. And usually you always look at, at the youth and I, I cannot buy that. So for me, for example, the relationship between elderly people and pigeons is a model for human animal relationships in this in the city for example because they're not owned by anyone they can come and go but at the same time we don't have to live in segregation and they have to be in national parks and so on this is like uh, and just one the last sentence of the of the energy of the book i don't know if i even used it in a it was used in the english translation but the chapter titled pigeons actually in the german title is pigeon vision we shit on everything you love <laughs> Um, uh, thanks. Thanks a lot for that. I suppose um, I would sort of. I would sort of. There have been two very interesting questions in chat. One uh, for Stefan, one for me. But I think I would just like to draw us into sort of the, the contemporary context for a moment and to discuss specifically the COVID nineteen pandemic and um, our respective opinions on that. I suppose as two sort of as a, as a few kind of framing points. I think there's a lot of obvious animal related issues. The first is the zootropic origin um, in, in bats, supposedly the bats of Wuhan, which have led various right wingers to even call this the China virus, um, which personally I find very ironic because since 2016, China has actually had a state policy at least um, to uh, halve its meat consumption to drop it by 50% um, on a national average. Um, through to, in the United States, the um, way that meat packing and um, meat processing factories have been kept open by Donald Trump's federal orders, which is a very interesting topic in itself, to the repeated breaks out in Germany, uh, breakouts in Germany where efforts to suppress the virus there have been sort of thwarted by this um, continuous meat eating. And then obviously the mink farming, sort of mega spreading, millions of, um, millions of a new strain of the virus being, being spread through mink farming. Uh, and the subsequent uh, uh, slaughter of, of millions of minks across Scandinavia. So um, maybe this is a maybe this is a, a topic with many animal-related dimensions. And I'd really like to hear any perspectives you have. Maybe we can start with um, Stephen. You're muted, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think we should uh, start off with a basic understanding about uh, capitalism and animals, and that would help us think about what happens with the spread of zoonotic diseases. And that is that we have to remember, and this is something that Marx ta taught us, and that is that um, animals are not there. Uh, we don't farm animals to be eaten. We farm them to make a profit for the entities that, that own them. Um, while animals have a use value, um, all, as Marx indicates, all commodities must have some use value in the marketplace, but that isn't why they're produced. And so the, pur the purpose is to bring profit to uh, the entity that uh, possesses them. And when we keep that in mind, the uh, madness of what goes on with the spread of zoonotic diseases becomes more clear. It isn't simply the case of Wuhan. Um, uh, there's uh, swine flus of various kinds, uh, poultry uh, spread flus. These are all things that are, are inevitable and are endemic in large scale farming, not just factory farming, but even smaller scale farms. Um, what happened in China, of course, is probably that the uh, interface between wild uh, creatures, wild domains and domesticated ones and farms uh, has been uh, shrunk. And uh, the passage from animal of animals, particularly bats from the wild to the domesticated uh, uh, facilitates the transmission of diseases. Uh, droppings from bats may become part of feed for uh, pigs or for chickens, uh, which is then taken up into the food chain, et cetera, and the disease winds up taking off. So uh, this is something that is endemic to the nature of capitalist development. So uh, really the, the um, stopping of the spread of zoonotic diseases has to mean a major intervention into a large scale a capitalist enterprise that is the farming and production of, of animals for meat. Um, uh, the idea of stop of having uh, meat consumption in China is crucial. We ought to have the same goals. If we don't have those goals and, and magnify them to the point of making meat uh, obsolete within a few generations, within a generation or two, then we're simply doomed. Uh, 
uh, cutting the fossil fuel use for electricity, electrical power won't be sufficient to get us out of the climate uh, CO2 hole we're in. We need to make this inroad in, in animal farming as well. Okay, Troy. Um... Um, I think this question kind of gets back to uh, the original question of agency and, the, and the, the influence of Haraway and Latour on this book, because I think at some level, the problem of zoonotic disease is a problem of nature and culture, whatever you want to call it, getting too mingled. It's, and the idea is as soon as humans um, are deforesting you know, large parts of the earth, whether to for actual for timber or for um, you know, for, to make mines or, or to grow uh, feed crops for other animals, which are then grown on factory farms and, and all this. And the expansion, of course, of uh, the number of domestic uh, you know, animals in the world is, is domesticated animals is, is a problem where we're simply, we have too many points of contact between us and other species. And that is leading to the production of a lot more uh, disease. And there has been a real explosion in the amount of new diseases that have been emerging since the 1970s when this process really takes off. Um, so, I th but to, to frame the problem in those terms would then require this, this goal of a separation at some level, as in we have to stop uh, controlling animals, we have to stop having, you know, eating meat and uh, dairy and all this and, and to uh, uh, actually put in there and to rewild larger parts of the earth and uh, make sure those ecosystems are actually functioning properly so there isn't as much uh, pathogen spill over and so forth. And, um, and that requires like a very unfashionable philosophically, you know, separation of this nature culture. So uh, if that reading is correct. So I wonder what Fahim would think about that. And to kind of reiterate that point, you have to just look back to uh, the start of um, modern public health, which is Edward Jenner's uh, development of the vaccine in 1798. And even then he was writing and he was saying the problem of disease does come from this intermingling of, of humans. We've grown too familiar with other creatures and that is the cause of all these problems. So it was clear back at the, you know, over two centuries ago, I think this point has been lost, right? Instead it's like, oh, big pharma is bad. They're not making vaccines or, or maybe like certain kind of practices are bad, but it's really this this whole um, bigger picture. And just to say one more thing real quick would be to prove this point is that if you look at uh, 1492, when Europeans came over to the new world, they found a, you know, uh, two continents that had lots of people, uh, probably as many people or more people there than in Europe, um, but in you know, large cities and, and so forth, but they didn't have very much disease. Right, and that's because they actually had very few domesticated animals, probably just llamas, really. And, uh, and because of that lack of uh, animal husbandry, they actually didn't have disease. So I'll leave it there, but um, I'll be interested to hear what Fahim and uh, Stephen thinks. Um, like, I would like to very shortly re respond to uh, both of you, Stephen and Troy. Uh, yes, I, I, would, uh, I would like to stress the point that the zoogenetic origin of this disease um, that so genetic, this so, so zoogenesis is not unilateral, obviously. Like there are far more animals who got diseases from humans than the other way around. And uh, for me, it's important to see that uh, it's not um, uh, like um, the connection of uh, animals and humans uh, or them meeting who, that produces all these problems, but exactly as, as, as Stephen and Troy said, it's uh, the context that very exploitative, uh, certain form, forms of hunting or livestock and so on. But coming to, uh, to, to two points, uh, like for me, it's not a problem, should we be segregated or not, but the way we are, are we, we meet animals is the, is, is the problem, how we meet them, in what context, and of course, these China issues, there are a lot of US and European capital groups who invested a lot in the Chinese market, especially in the poultry market at the beginning. So it's like the origin uh, capital wise is, uh, is different than just the yeah, species oriented. But what I wanted to say, vegetarianism will save us all um, or capitalism. Uh, I, I, I wonder, so like, like with questions like sexism or racism, I think abstractly, 
abstractly, capitalism would somehow abstractly would also work without these forms um, of social symmetries. To, uh, but the capitalism that really exists, I think it's very hard for it to, to work without these kinds uh, of atrocities and oppressions like racism, sexism, all this stuff. Is this also, is this also true for, uh, in context of animal exploitation? Is it even possible in reality, not only in abstraction, that, that we have a capitalism without animal exploitation? And the second thing is, what about the revenge? Like, is this, uh, Steve, what do you think and Troy? Um, because coming from a society originally uh, like Afghanistan, where revenge, a badal, like these things that are called vendetta in, in, in Italy, is also supposed to have very, not a lot of agency because there are rules and you have to do it. It's not that the individual thinks, I want to do a revenge. You have to do it. It's, um, it's systemic. Um, but maybe it's totally different with animals. But is this unthinkable that it is some form of revenge of animals or animality or the bodies uh, or does it even make sense to think it this way I think if I may I, th I think it does I think it does make sense um, with some um, caveats um, as you know in um, going back to our theme of socialist animal etc um, uh, Frederick Engels in um, dialectics of nature spoke about the revenge of nature he said that and in the short term, it may seem as if uh, humans have triumphed over nature, um, capturing all of its resources and, and enriching ourselves. But in the medium and long term, it's nature that takes its revenge. And he gives examples of uh, desertification of landscapes and uh, a loss of soils that have led to great famines, whether in Ireland or in Southeast Asia or wherever it may be. Uh, he describes it as revenge. Um, and revenge has this very active um, agent quality to it. So uh, taking it at the, at the metaphorical level, at least, I certainly agree that um, maybe the bats or whoever it is responsible for the spread of COVID have taken their revenge. Can you be more specific than that? I think you can if you treat the word revenge like we need to treat the word um, agency or agent. That is, it is assisted revenge or, or, or assisted uh, or mediated um, uh, revenge. That is, it isn't revenge based upon a single mind uh, that is choosing to deposit this bit of feces here in order to spread the disease to that place there, ultimately to make it to uh, the core hub of global empire, that is the United States, but rather that a set of systems um, works together to make such passage inevitable. So in that sense, I think, Fahim, you're right, that the, the parallel between what you're describing in, uh, in Afghanistan uh, and other um, places where there's, uh, uh, you know, blame is a very important cultural factor um, and revenge, that it is revenge of that kind. It's a collective revenge of, of animals and of nature against uh, a system that uh, hyper exploits it. Should I say something oh. too, sir? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Right. Um, I would say I wouldn't romanticize. I mean, first of all, definitely capitalism is a problem and is accelerating this process and is creating lots of disease, and that's clear. As this is happening way faster than it's done, it's ever happened before. But that's not to say that pre-capitalism was some kind of Eden. Obviously, I mean, you know, clearly, eight thousand years ago, you have leprosy emerging from I don't know a water buffalo, and uh, as in you have like, relatively small numbers of people and relatively few animals, and you still had new diseases emerging. As in all these diseases that we have now did not exist before uh, domestication of animals around, you know, in the start of agriculture 10,000 years ago. It's actually quite difficult for pathogens to cross species barriers without livestock. So um, I think we should keep that in mind. I think if, if we only got rid of factory farms and had like these little chicken coops in the backyard, that would still cause disease, right? Uh, we, albeit at a, a slower pace. The other thing about revenge, I'm personally skeptical of this idea. And Fahim, I think at some level, if I could point this, I mean, please push back, but I think you're contradicting yourself at some level. You're saying, well, we are also spreading diseases amongst animals. I mean, for example, with Ebola, that is, uh, you know, it, the gorillas got Ebola from humans and that has killed what a third of the gorilla population in, in parts of West Africa. So, I mean, like this is clearly not 
good, right? I mean, I clearly this is a problem. So this revenge idea is somehow that nature is getting the upper hand over us. And I think that's not true. It clearly it's just uh, a more unstable, um, degraded state uh, of the world, you know, the world biosphere. And that's the result of these things. So instead, and I think the way we should think about this, if we could maybe think about this philosophically is, is what Hegel you know, talked about the humanization of nature, this idea that you know, humans are instilling their consciousness into nature and they're transforming it. And this is, this is what history is, right? And the end of history is this hu fully um, humanized nature, right? As in when we are no longer alienated from nature because we, uh, our consciousness is in every part of nature. But that never happens because because we don't understand nature at some fundamental level, there's always this excess. There's always this, uh, we always have this result that we, we don't expect. I mean, it's like your termites in the book, for instance, um, that causes certain problems. And this, and so we have this increasing instability at the same time. And I think that this, and whether it's zoonotic disease or, uh, or termites in buildings, and then the solution at some level must be, we must recognize that there's certain limits of our ability to humanize nature uh, because it's just too destabilizing for both humanity and for the biosphere. Um, and at that point, I mean, I'd be interested to hear what you think, how do you think Heidegger fits into the book given the book's title uh, and how Marx fits into the book a bit more? Uh, but yeah. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I think I'll give him a, a chance to respond to that, but maybe briefly, because we have a few more questions to, to move on to. Sorry to say briefly respond to Heidegger, but um, do you have a... Like first, like coming from a Marxist tradition, I think it's not bad to be contradictory, like contradiction is a way med meditation uh, works. Um, uh, but it depends on what kind of contradictions, what kind of logic. So um, like this revenge issue, like for me in certain sense, um, like depression, to be depressed is also a form of revolt of your body. Like you, you lose all kind of interest, even interest in the interest. You cannot, you don't even take a shower. You don't get to, you don't go to work. Of course, it doesn't mean that this is for me a model of an emancipatory struggle. And I don't think that it's, also, <laughs> don't get me wrong, but there are elements of it also there. There's an element of resistance also of your body here. Um, um, and um, also, I like this, the Heidegger issue, you know, kind of, uh, there's only, I, <laughs> there's only one quote, uh, Preciado, um, the Onco Mouse ate up uh, Heidegger. So for me, it's, I don't have that much. <laughs> about this. this is an old Nazi. And <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think there was a very interesting question in the chat um, concerning instinct and the agentive. So perhaps, uh, perhaps that's, that response has covered that. Um, if not, then ask again in the Q and A, please. I have uh, another. I have another question of my own. So this concerns this question of the ethical dimension, um, the ethical dimensions of animal liberation and diet and whatever. Because it seems to me that this is a very prominent issue in many discourses and um, well discussions concerning animals. Is often often the question questions of uh, veganism. Uh, what what relationship we can have with nature and so on. I very often find this kind of reduced down to the personal, especially personal dietary choices. So this kind of individualized um, aspect. And this is something which makes it, often I have found this in, in my own attempts to kind of jumpstart conversations about uh, the politics of animals. This is always the thing that's come up. People have referred to their own needs, their own chronic illnesses and so on. Um, uh, as if these, th this is kind of the level on which we should we should talk about these questions so in recent thinking which i found most interesting um concerning animals there's either been this sort of doubling down john gray's new book uh feline philosophy is a great example where john gray is um just arguing that cats specifically cats can teach us a great amount about our life because cats are in a default state of happiness in that kind of playful predatory existence and they they operate without a care until something interferes with them and so John Gray is sort of saying well we, we have an ethical lesson to learn from animals whereas I think a lot of other work including being and swine is more bringing in the sort of interplay with political economy and sort of raising continual struggles um, 
between animals, including uh, including other species and humans, sort of as a, a continual problem in, in the political of thought, uh, the, the history of thought um, and whatever else. So I'm very interested to hear about what um, uh, what each of you think about the sort of question of, of ethics, political economy, how far those two things are opposed um, and sort of how they can speak to each other. Um, I'll throw that one open to anyone. Let me, I could respond maybe to the beginning of your question about uh, veganism and also that picks up something that Fahim said earlier, I think, which is in his book, uh, with that um, veganism or vegetarianism, as he said, it, um, hasn't saved any animals' lives. Um, yeah, Fahim, you're certainly right, I think, in the sense that um, industry works according to, um, uh, it doesn't produce more animals than it can sell. And in that sense, if people stop eating meat, um, it won't, quote, save animals. It may, however, prevent an aggregate of suffering. That is, more animals are produced, more animals are tortured and killed. Uh, there's more suffering in the world. So using a kind of um, hedonic calculus, um, like Bentham would have used, uh, going vegan means you're preventing suffering and uh, uh, emphasizing the possibilities of, of pleasure. Um, but I would also say uh, about Jules' point about veganism and people's response to, uh, to that when confronted with it about personal choice. Uh, veganism can also be seen as a movement, um, as a social movement, uh, like uh, perhaps um, uh, divestment was from uh, South Africa or divestment of fossil fuels or divestment from, from Israel uh, today in order to support Palestinian rights. Um, if uh, large numbers of people organize themselves and stop eating vegan, started to eat vegan, then presumably there'd be less demand for meat the meat industries would suffer. Um, there would be, in a sense, a control uh, by a popular uh, demand on that aspect, that large aspect of capitalism, of our capital. So um, I do think veganism is a potentially powerful political tool uh, in the struggle for animal liberation. Um, like, I come originally, when I was 20 years ago, from, from ethics department. Uh, and I, I personally, I think ethics is the most bourgeois part of, of philosophy, uh, individualizing these huge questions. I like, I personally think nothing I do individually will change the world, not in a relevant way, nothing, nothing. Collectively, all together and in complicated ways. Yes, of course, but not, it's not that important what I do in a political sense, but maybe in an ethical uh, sense. But then we, had, we would have to reframe the question, what, the, what, what is the ethical? Because it's a different, like ethical and political is not, uh, not always the same. And I wonder, like, I totally would agree with Stephen that uh, like communism as a real movement, uh, we could not just wait for the revolution. But at the same time, suddenly I... I, I behave like an old school Marxist, I don't believe, I think about the centrality of production, not consumption. And I personally, I'm skeptical that a lot of consumers will choose something and then the markets uh, will change. Um, uh, but as I understood you, as part of the real movement towards liberation, all these things uh, should, be, should be part of it. But I also wonder if it's more about our own emotions. We feel, I sometimes have the feeling veganism in a broad sense has a lot to do with purity. We see so many, so many terrible things and oppressive things and also all these um, cancer entities in our food. And I think veganism is also a reaction, um, a purifying reaction against this, um, this messed, uh, messed up world. So it's also a lot about our own um, emotions. And even though that may be very provocative, I have Muslim friends who are reacting in a certain way when they are ultra Islamic, very similarly in a certain sense. So there is all these atrocities, six wars against uh, Muslim countries and there's this capitalism, whatever. And then they don't, they want to have these pure spaces where terrible things don't happen because of the law. And sometimes I have the feeling um, my vegetarian and vegan um, comrades and friends, they wanna have pure bodies too. So it do, I don't want to say that everything is bad and everything is the same, but sometimes, ju just one example, you know, in Mexico, they, they found out that more and more 
uh, birds use cigarette butts in their nests because it's against par parasites. And honestly, this is also nature. So sometimes throwing away a cigarette butt would help Mexican birds. <laughs> so, and whenever I say this, <laughs> I don't really believe that we should throw away cigarette butts like that. But usually we are so used when it comes to nature that somebody has to tell us, now you have to do this. And when I tell these stories with the cigarettes, everybody says, what do you mean by that? Should we all smoke and throw away cigarette butts? <laughs> oh, no, but the political is broader than just do this and do that. And honestly, on your left heart, if you hear things, birds use cigarette butts in their nest. Do you think this is emancipatory, nature, culture, moving on? Or you think, you think that's a terrible picture, like this, you know, the bird that we always are shown with all the plastic in its body, as if it would mm. be necessarily the worst thing in the world to have artificial parts in, in your body, you know, pollution. That doesn't mean that a lot of animals are oppressed and suffer and so on, but we are used to only look at these negative aspects. Maybe there are all positive aspects to capitalism. Can I disagree with something here? Um, I think the characterization about uh, veganism as a personalistic, uh, self-affirming moral posture is mistaken. Um, the philosopher Gary Francione uh, speaks about veganism as a moral baseline, but that means it's, it's something that is essential that people do at an individual level, but it is not the end. It is only the, a baseline. By the same token, someone who's a feminist would certainly agree that as a moral baseline, uh, sexual harassment should be ruled out of court. Um, so uh, I think the parallel is, is strong there. Uh, we can expect people who are in support of animal liberation to at the very least uh, act in such a way as to not kill and not consume the subjects of their liberation struggle. Mm. Troy, do you have a, do you have, oh, sorry. Okay, no, very, no, I wouldn't agree with you. I think consuming food is more similar to consuming certain kinds of porn. Consuming them. Because you're not there harassing a, a woman on the street. And you're not running around and grabbing animals from the street. No, it happened. It is it is a system. And it, at one end, you're sitting there and consuming it. So I wouldn't say you can compare these two elements. No, it's eating meat is more like consuming porn. It also may be problematic and is and so on. But it's... Uh, Different. I think you're severing the connection between the consumption and production mistakenly, but I'll stop. I'll stop with that. Hey, I, would I would agree with Fahim that um, the vegan movement, the animal rights movement, does tend to be quite uh, individualistic. I think, and, and and based on you know utilitarian philosophy, and and is not interested in questions of capitalism and, and production and so forth. So I I, I think that's a, and it's a serious problem because there's simply not enough vegans and vegetarians, something like two percent of the population. Like that's never going to to do anything. And I think like the point, I mean, you, you elucidate in the book how all these pigs' bodies, they're you as in like the meat itself. Is only part of the business, not not even the profitable part. The actual profit comes from making glue and dyes, and you know Alex Blanchette has a, a new book out, and it talks about uh, um, the the binding and the book that he he wrote himself probably has pig in it and there's biodiesel and so forth. So I mean, uh, even if you're vegan, you're probably still using animal products, uh, whether you're aware of it or not. So the question come, becomes, what is a, a solution? And I think um, it has to be some kind of vegan Marxism, which demands uh, uh, mandatory um, restrictions on, on, on people using animal products. Like it has to be uh, planned and has to be prohibited and so forth to actually achieve any kind of real solution. So I think the left can't say, oh, it's too individualistic. And then you respond, well, then we should make it mandatory. And then they'll say, well, you can't do that either. So it has to be uh, one or the other. And I'm interested, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to hear what you think as a vegan Marxist, uh, what's the best way to really think about this problem? Um, so there's, there's one question from the, the chat I'm interested in bringing in. Um, please keep the questions coming in the Q&A, by the way, because there's some very interesting ones in there. And the question is from Jody Balland. And Jody asks, why is there so little reference to the animal question in existing academic discussions about the COVID pandemic? So that's for anyone. Well, there, there has been some. Um, there's been good reporting about it. 
uh, in monthly review in uh, New Left Review. Mike Davis has written about it. Um, um, who is that uh, scholar who wrote the uh, cover piece for monthly review about uh, three issues ago? Um, he's written about zoonotic diseases. Big Swan, I think it's called that's Big Swan. That's Wallace, Swine. right? Yeah, yes, that's right. And his book, his book is called Big Swine, Big Flu. So there has been discussion about it, but there hasn't been in the, certainly in the mainstream media. If you listen to NPR or the New York Times, there's very little coverage of it. So I agree with the, the premise of the question. Could I say something real quick? I mean, uh, I think there, there is, again, good reporting. There's a book called Spillover. Um, I think he's a National Geographic reporter that came out uh, eight years ago. Then it's like Sonia Shaw's book, Pandemic, that came out a few years ago. So there is this awareness uh, of these links. And I think, but there isn't much of like a radical solution. Like very few people then said, well, then we must, you know, eat less meat. And then we must, you know, really abolish these industries. That's the only safe thing to do. And someone like Davis is interesting because he knows this problem inside and out. He wrote a whole book on avian flu many years ago, but he does, you know, he himself is an omnivore and he does not ever say, uh, this is part of the, the politics. Um, uh, part of the necessary solution to get rid of this, and and and, and people are not unaware of this. Like the American uh, Public Health Association, they call for a moratorium on factory farms. You know, every year they they make this case. Uh, and after the SARS epidemic, there was uh, another editorial. I forget in which um, periodical, uh, medical peri periodical, but they're saying that if you don't want SARS to happen, you really have to address uh, cons meat consumption. So I think these voices exist, but they're really marginal. And instead people focus on, yeah, big pharma and, you know, in inept, uh, you know, the inept CDC or whatever it is, a political uh, uh, manipulation and, and fake news and all that. And I, um, Jules, and to, getting at your point about John Gray, I think it's interesting that it's really someone as conservative as John Gray is the one who's really the, you know, the main, you know, one of the, the uh, most important living philosophers dealing with um, animal issues. So of course, you know, you have the utilitarian uh, um, tradition and then you have this conservative tradition that is interested in animals and not much on the left, uh, I would say generally. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, um, yeah I, th I think it's also astonishing. Like here in Vienna, we have this until the last three weeks, we had this so-called hard lockdown. It's also the second hard lockdown. And it's crazy how it intervenes in all aspects of life and sociality. And it would be much easier to deal with it if people would also talk about how it came about this, this, this crazy pandemic, because it will things like that will come again and again. But there's a strange amnesia where we're only dealing with how can we manage it but not how can we like um, fight against the symptom, but not against um, the problem itself. But um, I think it's also astonishing that all these things happen like a world crisis and pandemic, and there's almost no new thought. Like there is like we have the whole world breaks down, <laughs> but it's very hard. I just found one Chinese Marxist group who uh, already in March wrote one interesting piece that I found one sentence in it that, that could not have been written before the pandemic. Everything else, theory-wise, you wouldn't have needed a pandemic. You, would have, you could have said it 30 years ago or 50 years ago, so it didn't uh, do anything with us. And there was a Swiss group, funnily enough, that also wrote a, a stimulating text apart, apart from the great Rob Wallace and so on. And for me, for example, the whole pandemic also made me think, you know, with these bats who ha have to flee and uh, because their habitats are destroyed and because of there's so much industrial uh, side, industrialized livestock, a lot of farmers have to switch to wildlife and so on. So they are very stressed and they have this, uh, this heat in their body. And that also um, makes the conditions so certain uh, viruses and vectors uh, can uh, proliferate. But what also made me think, you know, thinking about Thomas Nagel, this, um, if I pronounce his name correctly, this famous uh, Western uh, philosopher, when he was thinking about me and the bat alone in the dark, his famous uh, treaty, uh, what, how does it feel to be a bat? Um, and actually in his solution, there is no connection. You can never really know how it is to be a bat. 
And I always thought I have no idea how it is to be a white American philosophy, philosophy professor. It's a different world. I have no idea. I have no idea at all. So this pandemic made me um, strengthen my non-innocent solidarity with this uh, bad side, so, so to speak. It would be one just, approach to deal with it, not, yeah. I just wanted to add one, one plug for Animal Liberation Currents, which is an online a leftist um, uh, journal dealing with animal liberation. And there's a recent piece by John Sanban Matsu, who is a philosopher and others, uh, responding to uh, work in monthly review about animals, which refused to acknowledge the moral baseline of, uh, of veganism and the necessity of a vegan Marxism. So uh, I just want to put that out there to take a look at writings in animal liberation currents. Fantastic. Um, Sorry, I just wanted to add one little thing. 25 years ago, I was co-founder of the Vegan Society Austria. So 25 years ago, I was <laughs> the co-founder. I just thought that capitalism, uh, like on a, on a highway, uh, just took over this, this agenda. And uh, we, we don't need leftist group to promote veganism. I, I have to feel it. What, what do you mean by that? Sorry. Um, oh, okay. Oh, um, so, so uh, we've we've been asked uh, to go through one further question before we wrap up. Um, but there was a question specifically for me concerning connecting trans Marxism um, and the use of horse urine in earlier HRT um, research on guinea pigs and so on. So um, I can swiftly respond to this because this is um, an interesting story. So. Early, um, early uh, transgender hormone replacement therapy for trans women and other people who wish to family called Premarin because it was using um, pregnant mare urine uh, as an extract, kind of on an industrial scale. Um, this was known as conjugated estrogen and it sort of fell into um, disuse. So the two types of estrogen which fell out of use was conjugated estrogen from horses and also synthetic estrogens which were um, related to estrogens but not actually estradiol. And both of these were found to be incredibly unhealthy besides the um, unethical aspects of um, pulling, uh, pulling hormones on this kind of scale from continuously impregnated horses. Um, so for, for various reasons we now uh, use, uh, I say we, um, the, the pharmaceutical industry now uses uh, tubers, uh, aubergines, and other vegetables, which then have, uh, through a, a complex process I won't get into, basically have, they get broken down and then uh, reappropriated as, um, as pure estradiol, which is significantly safer. But there is, um, I think there's a, a much broader question there, which I sort of, I'm not able to get into about the history of endocrinology, which is always involved extensive animal experimentation. Like one of the first um, breakthroughs we had was a um, uh, removing the adrenal glands from dogs. But um, I suppose there's this question which I would just like to close with from Neil. Um, uh, and Neil asks about, uh, Neil basically asks this question. Is everyone following me? Okay. So um, uh, Neil's question is, can you comment on the work of interpreting the behavior of animals ethically, reading animals as comrades, neighbors, fellow travelers, and even our therapists? Why is the practice of interpretation so captivating? And why is it so effective as the spark for ethical political thinking and for our curiosity more generally? Okay, that is my final question. It's a profound question. I replied briefly in the, in the notes. Um, I think it does get at the um, essential uh, links that we all feel to animals, ones that children uh, note, perhaps again, because they haven't been trained out of it, children's identifications with animals, even effigies of animals, such as stuffed animals, is so powerful uh, that I wonder whether um, our, uh, our natural inclination is to use animals as uh, surrogates for ourselves in, 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 our, in addressing our emotions, our feelings, our relationship to others in the world. Um, so it is a natural resource for us and therefore a natural resource for 
fable, for poetry, for, for epics and sagas of all kinds, but that we have in recent decades or centuries trained ourselves out of that habit and only in certain authors are able to come back in, in the writings of Kafka, for example, or in Sigmund Freud, um, uh, in, in various others. So um, it's a very important broad question, but I, uh, I wonder what other people may, uh, may think about that. So this Try. reminds me a little bit of um, what you were saying uh, before about pigeons and old ladies and all that. And then there's also the, the part where you talk about Kafka going to the aquarium and, and becoming vegetarian upon seeing these, these fish where they are. And I would say that this, this ability to see nature, to be uh, in awe of nature, right? Or just to really feel connected to this nature is perhaps like a different kind of relationship to this uh, goal of humanizing nature, to, to put ourselves in nature and, and therefore um, remove any kind of strangeness anymore from it. So it's exactly that strangeness that is captivating, right? This unexpected uh, quality of nature. And I suppose, um, you know, if for example, during the pandemic, I took up birding, <laughs> like many other people, and just being able to go to a park in Toronto where they have North America's largest uh, cormorant colony where there's like 60,000 cormorants in one small place and they just take over the, this park. I mean, it's really, it's really awe-inspiring, it's really amazing. And I think uh, people, either they have to be taught to see this way or given opportunities to see nature this way, because otherwise there is this total disconnect and people just simply do not care. So the question then becomes, you know, how do we get people to actually uh, care about the destruction of the natural world, including lots of socialists who, again, we've been talking this whole time, do not care about animals, do not care really about uh, the environmental crisis. And I think part of the solution is um, this uh, Talking more this, about this, uh, this kind of this, this sight, this ability to see uh, nature um, in a way that that is different. And I think as, uh, we just talk about new kinds of relationships. For example, I'm I'm a bit skeptical of pet ownership. I don't, I'm not sure if pet ownership is really an ethical. Um, relationship at all and instead is like what is a different kind of relationship to the natural world and I think it would be this uh, connection without control uh, as you describe with uh, with these pigeons. Also um, very briefly like answering this last question or trying to to add something to that uh, to what Troy and Stephen said and also Jules uh, with these animals I would say Abstractly, it has something to do with the dialectics of identification and, uh, and uh, difference, so to speak. On a certain level, when it comes to dreams, for example, because animals don't only in inhabit um, our landscapes, but also our dreamscapes, also our political dreams. And so it's all a question, why do animals pop up in certain uh, dream situations? The very uh, famous one with Freud, but also a lot of others. And I think it has something to do that animals remind us of something that never happened. Because confronting it would mean to also, um, in a radical sense, to, to make us precarious, to put our existence also on a level of the subjectivity into risk, uh, so to speak. But um, also adding just a little, uh, a little something um, to another question, um, Jody Berland, uh, no, Sorry, there was a question with virus, uh, virus and, and, and COVID. I just, because I also write about it in my book, I think we have to be very, we have to try to be very precise too in, in this moment. For example, there's this very famous Mixotricha paradoxa, this, this, this entity, you know, it's a, it's a microbial entity um, in, the, in the intestines of, the, of a South um, Australian termite species and Doran Harvey and STS made it very famous very shortly. So it looks like a little bit like a hairy potato with five long hairs and uh, also the name Mixotricha paradoxa, strange entity with mixed up hair. So the question is, is this one entity or because there are five different genomes, like every one of these hair has an own DNA and the long hair is also in DNA. And inside the cell, you found two other forms of DNA. So one, 
one way to address political questions through the microscopic is, for example, to, re to take not only literature, psychoanalysis, um, whatever, as a resource for political thinking, but also, for example, biology or animals as living metaphors. And in this sense, you don't know, says Hannah, Donna Haraway, is this entity one or is it five or is it 10 million? But I would say it's also important not to just fall into the trap of um, the, the rainbow of nature. So another colleague, because we all just are using the works of others, said you could also say that these entities are maybe gallery slaves, stick there and forced to labor for this microbe. So I think there are many, many possibilities to find progressive, emancipatory aspects in the animal world, even in the, in the microscopic spaces. But it could also be that we find out that uh, some animals are, are worse oppressors, if they know it or not, than capitalism ever was. Maybe. But no space is innocent, so what would be, would be just my question. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, um, so perhaps um, this is a. I think. Uh, yeah. Perhaps this is a good note to leave us on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll uh, wrap it up here. I just wanted to thank you, Jules, for moderating, and um, thank you, Stephen Troy and Fahim, for the really lively discussion. Um, and thank you to everyone who tuned in to watch. Uh, once again, I really encourage everyone to check out the rest of the Radical December event schedule. There's some really good ones coming up in the next week. So um, get on the website and check it out and uh, hope you have a great day. Thank you for coming. Thanks everyone, thank you. I'm gonna log now, but thank Thanks you so for much. the discussion. Yeah. Jules? That was a lot of fun. Yeah. 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 Jules, are you still here? Uh, I think she's muted, but still here. I, yeah. Because sometimes I had really, pro because I was very much interested what uh, Jules had.